as we will come into this congregation, Lord, we ask that your presence be here, oh God. Thank you for keeping us, oh God, over the week and over the years and over the months. Oh Lord God, as we go into this service, we just ask that you'll help us to be obedient to your word. Thank you for all that will transpire in the building and bless every heart that beats in the name of Jesus with the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. Thank you for remaining standing as we go into our hymn of the morning, number 608, Faith is the Victory.
be seated. Our announcement for this morning. Next week is the Bible Workers Day. And they are looking for you to participate with them. Because it's just not the Bible workers, it's the entire church doing a mission for God. They will have dinner for us, but after dinner, we want you to put on those walking shoes because we, we are going out into the neighborhood to reach as many people as we possibly can. Amen. Vacation Bible School starts in another week, July 29th, and today is Elder's Day. They have prepared something special for you, things that you probably didn't expect from an elder. What is Sabbath School PM edition? I didn't know it either. But this afternoon at 3.30, they will have a special program just for you. Be before that, they would like for you to join them in the multipurpose room for dinner. Coming up in August the 4th is our church picnic. And we invite everyone to attend. Amen. It's a time when the d church come, uh, can get together and really enjoy fellowshipping together. I would like also on Thursday, the daughter of Beverly Dunlap will have a memorial service here. So we encourage you to in come in and give this family support. And we ask you for a special prayer. The other announcements are in your bulletin. Please read and thank you. Happy Sabbath, Market Street. I come to you on behalf of your Market Street Children's Department, Vacation Bible School, amen. Vacation Bible School, July 29 to August 2nd. What are those dates? Amen. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we, our theme is God in nature. God in nature. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about what was the largest land animal in the world. And you so smartly said the African bull elephant, tipping the scales at 13,000 pounds. Now, that's a big animal. The second is the, the African white rhinoceros. That's 5,100 pounds. But I'm asking you this morning, scholars, what is the third largest land animal? The third largest. I hear someone say the hippo, and that is correct. The hippopotamus is 4,000 pounds. Pounds. Now, our children's story today is featuring the hippopotamus, so listen for that. VBS, each one reach one. Love is an action word. God bless you, Market Street. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. We welcome you to the annual Board of Elders program. We'd like to thank all of you uh, in advance for all of those who are assisting us in our program today. Once again, we ask that you stay by after lunch to participate in our AYS program where we plan to give Bible answers for Bible questions. I extend greetings to you on behalf of our senior pastor, Edwin Brown, who's not with us today, and certainly our associate pastor, Preston Willis, who's in Alabama with his fiancée, sister Jocelyn, preparing for their marriage. We certainly want to keep them in our prayers. Do we have any visitors here with us today? If so, we ask you to stand and introduce yourself to us so that we can put a spotlight on you and give you a special Market Street welcome. Any visitors at all? If not, with that said, we don't have any visitors. We extend to you greetings once again from Market Street. We have a visit. I'm sorry. Can you uh, tell us your name and where you're from? Uh, my name is Michael. Michael? Yeah, I'm from the town of Bay. Move to the Bay Area. Checking us out. I hope we meet all of your expectations. And the young lady standing next to you? Amen. They were here a couple of weeks ago. Bless you. We welcome you. We've been spotlighted them, so we want you to go by and shake their hands. We also want to welcome Pastor Jeremy. 
We wanted someone today that's going to come, and as I told him before, just preach the paint off the wall. And if you want to break out in song, that's all right, too. I've often been told that it's Sabbath all day long. So we have worship, we have lunch for you, and we have biblical questions and answers for you. So we want to, once again, start our welcome music, and uh, we want you to greet our visitors Pastor and Sister Germany and their guests, and just have a good time in the Lord. Thank you. If we can make our way back to our seats so that we can continue with our program, please. As you make your way uh, to your seat, once again, we want to reemphasize uh, the fact that the uh, Bible workers meeting and day next week just reemphasizing, that means we're going to double up on it. We also <laughs> want to remind you that uh, we're going to do a selection of the steering committee on the 27th, next Sabbath. It'll be real quick. Uh, we want to bring up our elders' corner this Sabbath. Uh, Elder Chapman will lead out in that. Thank you. Elder Chapman's giving me directions from the floor, and you know, I can only listen to one voice at a time. Most of the time, it's my voice, but. Uh, <laughs> Everyone know Robert. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. You know, Pastor, uh, Elder Charles said that Pastor Brown was gone. He is gone but he left some instructions, and all the instructions he gave to me, everyone else have got up here and did. So to be obedient, I'm going to repeat it again. Remember the memorial service for DeAndre Wiggins here at Market Street, July the 25th, 2019, at 11 o'clock. And keep your prayers going up for her mother, Beverly Dunlap, and her father, Anthony Wiggins, and their family. 
let's celebrate. Although we cannot be in Huntsville, but let's celebrate the marriage of our associate pastor, Pastor J. Preston Willis. Yes. Tomorrow in Huntsville, Alabama, July the 26th. Plan to attend and invite a guest for the Bible Works this day, July the 27th, 2019. And plan to support and pray for the staff of the Vacation Bible School. Pastor Brown and the team are praying for the success of each thing. Now, elders, he left a note for you. And it says, to the elders of the Market Street SDA Church, as I was pondering and searching for words of wisdom to give you today, I found the quote below by Nell DeConning. I could not have said it better myself. Elders, in the sight of God and man, you are to guard yourself and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. Be a friend and Christ-like example to children. Give clear and cheerful guidance to young people by word and example. Bear up God's people in their pain and weakness and celebrate their joys with them. Hold in trust all sensitive matters confided to you. Encourage the aged to preserve in God's promises. Be wise counselors who support and strengthen the pastor. Be compassionate, yet firm and consistent in rebuke and discipline. Know the scriptures, which are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Pray continually for the church. Remember at all times that if you would truly give spiritual leadership in the household of faith, you must be completely mastered by your Lord, 1 Timothy 3, 2, and 7. In closing, I, as your pastor, will continually lift you up to Christ and strive to it, submit myself to God as your under-shepherd. Thus, together, we will serve for the benefit of God's kingdom and his subjects. May God bless you abundantly and present you faultless before the Father by the grace of Jesus Christ. Yours in Christ, Pastor Edwin F. Brown, Senior Pastor, Market Street Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you. Several months ago, during the course of one of our elders' meetings, we planned our Board of Elders Day. And we searched our minds so that we could do something special. It was easy for us to pick out a couple of people to give a plaque to, a plaque that's going to collect dust. And we chose to do something else. So we want to honor two of our longest-serving elders, ordained elders here at Market Street. So we want to honor elder, all of our elders are special, but these are two special elders ordained at the Market Street, has been so for a long time. So we're going to invite Elder Arthur King and Elder L.J. Morgan if they would come forward so that we can acknowledge their longevity as ordained elders here at the Market Street Seventh-day Adventist Church. We want to, as pastor always say, we want to show them some love for ourselves mm -hmm. and for them. <laughs> Elder King, when I came to the elders board, I've known LJ for a long time. I, I remember being in, in Bible studies when I was 10 years old. 
listening to LJ, who was part of the grown folk. And I'm just sitting up there listening. Elder King has been one of my main supporters for a number of years as it relates to the Board of Elders. Elder King, who is also involved in the police chaplaincy, been involved for a long time, and his involvement in Market Street is legendary. When he speaks, he has that nice pause, and you wait for something profound to come out of his mouth. More often than not, it is something profound. We have a great appreciation for Elder King, and we want to show him our appreciation today by giving him this small token from the Board of Elders as to how we appreciate Elder Dr. King. Amen. You know, I knew he was going to say something. I didn't even have to invite him. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me your great salvation to afford me free. Love you all. Amen. And I've been given the, the great privilege and honor to say a few words to our own elder, L.J. Morgan. Uh, I've been at this church for 20-something years, and I remember uh, way back then, Elder Morgan, and I, I get particular, since I've been here at Market Street, particular pleasure in uh, verbal duels with our Elder Morgan. Uh, as I lead out in Morning Manor or Sabbath School, I, if he's in the house, I know he is going to keep me on the straight and narrow. Uh, he will tease out a point. And I am more than happy to engage because at the fruit of it, at the end of it, uh, God is uplifted and, and, and his, his word is, is, is given more clear. I've always been taught to respect my elders in years. And I respect Elder Morgan. I, expect, I respect his viewpoint. Uh, because somewhere in that viewpoint, you know, though, though there's a disparity in age, somewhere in that viewpoint, there is a meeting of the minds, and, and the spirit, I know the spirit dwells in him, and uh, I invite the spirit to dwell in me, and so together, I, I guess we say in today's verbiage, iron sharpens iron, Amen. and I can tell you, he's uh, that old stock of iron, and I appreciate it. I appreciate L.J. Morgan, and uh, this board came together and selected him as one of our uh, uh, elders that we wanted to recognize today, and as such, as uh, you know, we, we, we deal in equality here. And so if we gave Elder King something, we're definitely going to give our Elder Morgan a token of our gift. And as we spoke this morning, Elder Morgan, this money doesn't belong to you. It's, 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 you're going to steward this money, correct? Amen. Thank you, Elder Morgan. Well, I must say this was a complete surprise. But the main thing it is, we are individuals that are all striving for one goal. Amen. Yeah. And uh, as the brother said about speaking out, it's just like I look at things just like it is uh, when you're on the street and you see a little child about to cross a freeway, a highway, and you know that there's danger out there. Do you allow that child to go by and say, well, he made it or he didn't make it? We're all here to help one another. We're here to meet one another at that beautiful gates. That's what it's all about. It's not that I want the honor, I want the glory. That's not what it's all about. The glory is that we all make it in. God bless each one of us. Amen. Amen.
Happy Sabbath again. Can you stand as we sing our theme song? Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. Well, it's praise and worship time. And I don't know about you, but I got a praise on my lips because he's been just that good to me. Now, if you're able, and more or less if you're willing, you can stand on your feet and join us, and join in with us, because I know everybody here has got something to be thankful for, something to give God praise. And the, the song that we're going to start out with, it just simply says, Jesus will. So if you, if you ain't sure that you can praise, then just, just say, Jesus will. That, he'll help you. He'll help you. Come on, everybody right here. Right here for me. Come on. Now, y'all got to loosen up. Y'all acting real tight in here this morning. So I need y'all to loosen up. You know, kind of shake it off. And if you know that you know that you know that you know that Jesus will, then you can join in with us and you can be a witness to the fact that Jesus will. Whatever you're asking for, he will. Come on, yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling it just in the music. I'm getting my, I'm getting my happy praise on, come on. Make all my decisions for me. Jesus will. Jesus will. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. Who will make all my decisions for me? I found out a long time ago that Jesus will. I got another question for you. Well, 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 well. And who will make all my decisions? Every one of my decisions for me. Jesus will. I know that he will. Jesus will. Think about it. I want to know, I want to know who will make all my decisions, my decisions for me. Nobody but Jesus will. I tried him and I know he will. Come on, say it again, help me cry. Oh, who will make all, come on. 
Come on, y'all can say that. Everybody can say that. If you want to be right, that Jesus do it. He will. Yes, he will. Well, listen, when I'm in trouble, come on and help me. Well, when I'm in trouble, he gives. Nobody but Jesus. He will put a song in your heart in the night season. Come on, say it. And oh, oh, dear Lord. Well, who make you do right? Yeah. When you want to do, when you want to do, when you want to do wrong. Yeah. Jesus. I know that he will. Nobody but Jesus will. Come on.
master, savior. Has he been faithful to you? Is it the sweetest name that you know? How do you call it? Jesus. Jesus. When you call him in the midnight hour, does he answer? Has he helped you on your sick bed? Has he been with you on your job? If you love him, say amen. amen. If you came to worship with him today, say hallelujah. hallelujah. If you like to come down to the altar to lift up your private praise and thank him and give him glory, Come on down. Oh, there's something about that name. The sweetest, the sweetest name I know. Yes. Those who choose to remain in your seat, I'm going to ask that you humbly bow, bow your head, close your eyes. Our Father and our God, we're so grateful that you woke us up this morning and started us on our way. We thank you for bringing us here to Market Street where we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We love you, Lord. We claim your promises, and we want to be saved in your kingdom. I want to pray for our sick and shut-in and those that have lost loved ones today. I pray for the Henry Brown family and ask that you be with Charlotte and her family members. I pray for the Dondrea Wiggum family and ask that you be with Beverly Dunlap and be with Anthony and Sister Wiggum and Sonny and, and Linda and Zedrick and all of their family members. I pray for Wilhelmina this morning who's rehabilitating from her recent sickness. I ask that you bless Sando, Jocelyn's brother, who's recovering from heart surgery. Pray for Pastor Anderson and his recovery. Please be with Eileen Middlebrooks, Marcia Weir. Be with Pastor Brown and Sister Brown as they travel. I pray that you bless our members that are here that might be sick as well. Father, we thank you. We just want to say thank you this morning. I want to personally thank you for what you've done for me in my recovery with my knee replacement and giving me the strength and ability to be out here this morning. I want you to bless Pastor Germany, and it's so good to see his wife, Tierra, today, and I ask that you anoint them and continue to use them as your ministers. Bless the message that he will give today. Let us open up our hearts, open up our minds, and hear the word. So we thank you, we love you, and we claim your promises. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, those who believe say it together, Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you.
Happy Sabbath. You know, this is the good part of the program. Good part, great part. And I'd like the uh, deacons to rise at this time to raise the offering. I'll say a prayer as they assemble. Kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the things that you give us. We know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You challenge us, challenge us in Malachi. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me in tithe and offering. But then you also challenge us that you will open the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing to us. Father, there's nothing we can give you because you give us everything. But we ask, Lord, that in returning this tithe and this offering to further your work, not that you need it, because you give us everything, and more so grace and mercy. So we thank you for this opportunity to give back to you in tithe and offering. Bless each person here today. Bless those online. And just thank you. Let this money be fruitful and multiply and be used to further thy cause. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves little children. Jesus loves little children. It's time for a children's story. Come on down. Jesus loves the little children. It's your children's story time. Amen. Now, 
instead, every Sabbath, we ask you to say happy Sabbath. We're not going to do that this time. If you'd be so kind, can you let our young people know by a big happy Sabbath on the count of three that you love them? One, two, three. Happy Sabbath. Oh, do you feel that? They just wrap their arms around you. Amen. Amen. So we're talking about God in nature in, in uh, Vacation Bible School. And today I told you our story was about a hippopotamus. Okay, now this hippopotamus was on his way to the water hole, to the river. And as he was walking, you want to see our hippopotamus? See that? It's our hippopotamus. He's walking to the water hole. And he ran into, I want you to tell me what this is. Zebra. Say it loud. Zebra. A zebra. That's a zebra. He ran into a zebra and he says, what are those things all over you? And this is, he said, well, well, I'm a zebra, and these are stripes. And he said, stripes? Well, what are they for? He said, well, when we stand together, they, they can't tell the difference from us. It, it helps protect us. Stripes. i got to have some. So the hippo found some coal, and he started rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. And before you know it, he, he had stripes. And he said, Wow. I've got stripes. They're going to love me at the river. And he kept on walking and walking, and he ran into something else. And what is that? A lion. Say it. Lion. A lion. And he says, what is that wonderful thing around your neck? And the lion said, well, it's my mane. And he says, well, what's it for? He says, well, it tells all the other lions that I'm grown up and I'm strong. A mane. i got to have one. So he found some river reed, and he wrapped, and he wrapped, and he wrapped, and you know what he did? He, he found a mane, and he put the mane on. Now I'm a hippo with a mane and with stripes. They're going to love me at the water hole. And he kept on walking, and he ran into, what is this? An elephant. An elephant. Say amen. amen. An elephant. And he says, well, what are you? He says, I'm an elephant. And he says, well, what's that thing on your face? It's a trunk. Well, what's it for? He says, well, I can drink water. I can grab food and eat with it. I can even give myself a shower. A oh, trunk. I got to have one. And so he found an old acacia wood, and he stepped on it and mushed it, and he pushed his face real hard into it. And you know what you have? You have a hippo with stripes and a lion's mane. And he finally made it to the river. And he ran into another hippo. And his friend said, well, what happened to you? He said, nothing. I've got this trunk. And I've got this mane. And I have stripes. Don't I look good? And he says, well, wait a minute. God made you so that you could eat grass. We have a big mouth that's designed so we can, we can eat a lot of grass. We eat a lot. How are you going to eat? I didn't think about that. <laughs> so he shook off that trunk. And then he said, well, what's that thing around your neck? That's my lion's mane. Doesn't it look good? He says, well, we're hippos. We go under the water. We'll get tied up in all of the vines under the water. You can't have that. Oh, I didn't think of that. So he shook it off. And then he says, well, what are those stripes on you? Well, I got that from the zebra. Doesn't that look good? He says, wait, you're a hippo. Our skin is special. It has oil on it, and it keeps us cool when it's hot, and, and it keeps us warm when it's cold. You can't have that. I didn't know that. And he shook it off. And in the end, guess what he was again? Just a hippo. A special hippo. You mean God made me special just the way I was? He said, yes. Now, I want you to put your arm out like this. Stand up. Stand up. Put your arm out like this. Put your other arm out. Like you're going to give a hug. Now, give yourself a hug. God made you special just the way you are. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're special just the way God made you. All right, I need two prayers. All right. 
Guess what I'm going to do? It's Elder's Day. And I'm going to have Elder Childs come up and pray for these young people. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we come thanking you for your grace and mercy. Lord, as we look at ourselves and uh, prayerfully, we'll see a reflection of you. Amen. Lord, I trust and pray you'll continue to be with these young people, not only today, Lord, but throughout the remainder of our lives, of their lives. Lord, I trust that you will wrap your arms around them and let them be themselves in you so that all that they come across might see a glimmer of you in their lives. But guide and direct and be ever present with each and every one of us, not only today, but Lord, throughout the remainder of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Amen and happy Sabbath. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Elder Bobby Moore. I am younger than Robert. It has been my privilege, just privilege to serve as one of the elders for this treat for many years, and it's always good when we, when we can come before God's people. I have been, come, been given the distinct privilege of announcing and doing the bio for our speaker for this morning, this Sabbath. Pastor Kietrich. Key Germany, hails from Sacramento, California. Raised in a God-fearing home, he learned from a very early age about God and the importance of the Bible. One evening, when he was eight years old, Kietrich's mother took him to an evangelistic series where he sensed God calling him to follow him, and Kietrich gave his heart to God. At around the age of 12, Kietrich began to study the Bible earnestly. He was so excited about the truth that he was learning that he regularly held Bible studies with his friends before school each morning, pleading with them to give their lives to the Lord. It was then that he began to sense that God was calling him into the ministry. After graduating high school from Sacramento Adventist Academy, Kedrick went on to receive a ministerial degree from Oakwood College, now Oakwood University, in Huntsville, Alabama. He soon returned to Sacramento and worked as a youth pastor for the Capital City SCA Church. From there, he attended Andrews University to pursue his Master's of Divinity degree from the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary. With a single semester left to complete his Master's, he was hired as the assistant pastor of the Oakland Market Street SCA Church. Amen. That's here, y'all, where he served for four years. Amen, amen again. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. In the winter of 2013, Kietrich was hired as a pastor of the Oakland Elmhurst SEA Church, where he currently serves. Amen. He is married to the lovely Tierra Germany, Amen. formerly Tierra McQueen, where they reside together in Oakland. Amen. 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 After the song of meditation, we will hear the voice of our speaker for today, Pastor Kietrich, Germany. Happy Sabbath again. Before I sing, I always get this burst of nervousness. If I'd have known that it was Pastor Germany who sings himself, I enjoy how he starts his sermon. So, you know, I was asked to do this, so I'm going to sing mine, but I hope he put a little bit to it as well. <laughs> Amen. God is faithful.
Great, great. There we are. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto whom? To me. I'm sure he's been grateful, to, been uh, faithful to you. But the song says he's been faithful to me. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Happy Sabbath, Market Street. Sabbath. It's so good to see you. It's been a, it's been a little while. Been a little while. But amen, amen. We're praising the Lord. We're able to worship together today, and my soul has been richly blessed thus far, along the way. Amen and amen, amen. Well, I want to say a quick thanks to your pastors for opening their pulpit. I know that they are traveling and uh, blessing upon uh, uh, your new associate who is getting married this weekend. Amen, amen. That's a beautiful thing. Praise the Lord. So I want to say thank you to opening the pulpit. And I want to say thank you to the elders for this invitation for the elders uh, day here at Market Street. Um, I have to admit that they have been very gracious to me. I got the invitation a while ago, and I was supposed to send them some information this week, and I did not get that information to them. And uh, I am so glad they didn't stand up here and tell all my business to all of you that I have not been faithful in this regard. But uh, I want to let you know that uh, I've been, the reason I did not get to them, it's no excuse, but uh, I, I didn't get to them because I've been very busy, been very busy. Right now we're in the middle of, at Elmhurst, we're in the middle of an evangelistic series entitled The Live With Hope Project. Yeah. Live With Hope Project. We're fin finishing week number two and, and we've been having a good time. In fact, we have uh, one of your own coming to sing to us on a regular basis, uh, evangelist Jackie Tolbert. I, I heard her. There she is. Uh, and so uh, we're praising the Lord. She's coming on out. Uh, matter of fact, I think she's supposed to be here next Sunday, on s tomorrow, uh, singing for us as well. And so uh, the Lord's been good. Let me tell you what's been going on with the Live With Hope Project. This past Sunday, we had a fish fry and fun day. Yeah, we invite the entire community for a fish fry. I'm talking about how busy I've been. Fish fry and fun day at the church. We invited our community. Let me tell you, we had a good time. We brought in some, some good fish, uh, some clean fish. Yeah, some clean fish, some clean fish. And then we also had the Veg Hub come out and also cater as well. We had some, some good uh, peach cobbler. Mm -hmm. We had some, some, some kale salad. We had, uh, we had some, uh, some fish, but we also had some hot sauce. You can't have fish without... Yeah, we had some hot sauce, hot sauce, and, and so uh, God bless. And not only that, but we had, a, it was a, the, one of our elders put, uh, was the one in charge of putting it on. We had a great time. Uh, they had a candy bar where you can go and get, grab some candy and uh, popcorn and snow cones, and, and we had slushies, and uh, we had a number of great food and uh, entertainment. And so we also had a dunk tank. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a number of different things. We had a, a, a van with nothing but video games video games in the van, and we had, had a great time, a bounce house for the little ones. So that was on Sunday. That was on Sunday. And then we've been preaching each night of the week. We've been preaching four nights this week uh, for the evangelistic effort. And then we're preaching tonight, and I want to invite you out tonight. It's Sabbath all day. We're going to invite you out tonight at 7 o'clock. We'll be preaching under the title, uh, The Come Up. The Come Up. Last night, it was All I Do Is Win. That was the message last night. All I Do Is Win. You missed a good one. It was, it was a barn burner. All I do is when God is gracious. And so tonight is the come up, the come up. Anybody need a come up in their life? You know what that is? That's, that's, that's when you're not doing too well, but all of a sudden God blesses you and you, you, you have the come up. Well, we're talking about the come up tonight at 7 o'clock. What time did I say? 7 o'clock. You want to come on out and invite some friends, some family, some neighbors, and, and come to the Live With Hope project. And so not only do we have that going on, but tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we have a health clinic at the church. So we had fish fry last Sunday. This coming Sunday, we have a health clinic at the church. We are partnering with Amen Adventist Medical Evangelism Network, and they are bringing free dental care, free optometrists coming in. We have a barber coming in to give free haircuts. We have a masseuse coming in to give free massages. They were partnering with Alameda County. They have an imaging uh, van that's coming as well that's going to do uh, free breast cancer screening. We're also partnering with Emmanuel Temple. They're coming in to do free blood pressure work. We got a lot of stuff going on with the Live With Hope Project. We're trying to bring hope to Oakland. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. 
And I love your theme song. I'm going to have to get the words to that. We might have to sing that at our church. We're, we're trying, to, trying to win people for the kingdom of God. And so that's a good thing. So we've been really busy. I apologize. I didn't get all the information that I needed to. In fact, not only did that happen this week, but as of yesterday, as of yesterday, my wife and I celebrated our 10-year wedding anniversary. <laughs> In fact, when I was the associate pastor, the assistant pastor here at Marker Street, I got married just like your assistant pastor did, is doing this week. And we got married, and so it's been 10 years since that time. I love you, baby. 10 years. So today we've come for Elder's Day, and I just want to remind those of us who are here the importance of our elders, particularly of your elders. These men and women are the under-shepherds of Christ himself called by God to shepherd this church, and it is a wonderful job that they're doing. For those of you who've never been in a leadership position, leadership is hard. Leadership is hard. Uh, you know, they, they say uh, leading people is like trying to herd cats. They, they, just, they just don't want to do what you want them to do. They, they go in all kinds of directions, and, and so leadership is hard, but the leadership here at Market Street has shown great stability, shown great longevity and great responsibility. And so we want to, to honor these men and women who have done so much. Why don't you put your hands together for your elders, the elders of this church. Oh, you can do better than that. I'm not talking about Elmhurst elders. I'm talking about Market Street Elmer elders. They have done a wonderful job, wonderful job. In fact, today they've given me the responsibility of, of, of speaking under their theme, which is faithfulness, which is what? faithfulness, faithfulness. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds for the word of God, I want you to, to sing a song with me. Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> could, you, could you join me in a song? It simply says, pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. to declare, pass me not. that chorus again. I'm calling Satan. that chorus again. Come on, lift your voice. Call him like you need him. Thank you. 
more time. Come on. Call him. Come on. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into this place calling upon your name. For now it is your time, dear Lord. I pray that your sweet spirit might fill this place. I pray, Father God, that you will make this holy ground because of your presence. That you may be enthroned in our praise, Father. I pray right now, dear Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, that I might decrease and you might increase. Father, I pray that Jesus Christ alone might be lifted up, that we might be drawn to him. And I pray, Lord God, that you will stand behind every word from the word of God. I pray in the name of Jesus that that word might find root in our lives and transform us from the inside out. You promise that your word will not return into you void, but will accomplish that for which you sent it. So, Lord God, I pray that you will transform the stammering tongue and give me the very word of God. I pray in the name of Jesus that when all is said and done, Done today father God that we might be transformed that we might be changed that we might be brand new because of this word and when you cross the sky I pray that we might hear those words well done thou good and faithful servant this is my prayer for Christ's sake loving you always amen and amen amen Well, this afternoon, I've entitled these remarks simply, Well Done. Well Done. Several years ago, I read a story of a little boy who got up early one morning to do something special for his mother. He wanted to cook her breakfast in bed. Just a little boy, and he decided he wanted to do what Mama had always done. He decided that he wanted to make pancakes for Mama. And so he tried to remember all the things that Mama had done. So he snuck down into the kitchen, and he opened the cabinet, and he stood on his tiptoes, and he pulled out the big, big pot, and he plopped it down there on the counter. He got out the big spoon, Mama's spoon, and he pulled it out the drawer, and he got ready to, to make himself some pancakes for Mama. For Mama. He loved his Mama. And so he went and he looked for some flour and, and he could barely reach up there. So he got his fingers on the canister and he tipped it over and there was flour all over the place. And he scooped it up off the floor and put it inside the bowl. He was making pancakes for mama. He, he loved his mama. And he thought to himself, uh, what else did mama put in pancakes? And he went to the refrigerator and he stood and he looked around and, oh, there must be some milk. Milk must go in this. And so he grabbed the carton of milk and, and it began to slip out of his hand and it, it spilled all over the floor. But that's all right. There's still some milk in here. And so he picked it up and he poured it in the bowl. He had no idea how much he's supposed to put in there. He just, he poured it until it, it, the spirit whispered to him, that's enough, child. And while he's working, he's trying to think, what else goes into this, to this concoction for pancakes? And while he's doing all this, the, the milk on the floor and the flour there attracted a little kitten. And the kitten came in to the kitchen and began to lick it up and began to traipse around. There were little footprints all over the place. And he tried to shoo them away from the, 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 the big old bowl that, that was, the, the kitten was licking around. Stop, stop, stop. I'm making this for mama. He went to the refrigerator and found some eggs, and, and lo and behold, the eggs slipped out of his hands, and they cracked and spilled all over the floor, and, and he was beginning to get a little frustrated. He was beginning to get frustrated because he was making these pancakes for whom? Mama. Making them for mama, and he loved his mama. But things just didn't seem to be turning out quite right as he, as he tried to crack egg after egg and shell after shell fell into the batter with it and he began to stir and he wasn't sure what to do next. What am I supposed to do? How do I make pancakes? Do I put sugar in this? 
How do I make pancakes? Do I cut on the oven? I know mama said don't touch the oven, but should I cut on the oven? How do I make pancakes? And as he was trying to figure out what he was doing, he was making his way over to the oven, to the stove, when he slipped and fell in the mess that was on the floor. Now his bum was hurting. He was covered in flour and egg and milk. There were footprints all over the kitchen, and he just knew there was going to be a problem for all of a sudden. Lo and behold, standing in the doorway was mama, hands on her hips, staring at all the mess that was all over the place. And there he sat in his mess. He had tried to do something nice for mama, but he had made a mess of everything. And I wonder today, sometimes we're like this little boy. We desperately want to please the Lord, but we make a mess of things. Can we tell the truth today in church? Is that all right? That even when we want to do, God, do what God asks us to do, we make a mess of things. And I'm wondering today, wouldn't it be nice to have God pat us on the back and say, you've done good. You gave it your all and I appreciate it. I, I know you, what you tried to do. Wouldn't it be nice to hear God say, well done. Well, today I want us to discuss this idea of how to get the pat on the back from God, the attaboy, the well done from the most high. How can we get it when we know we mess up all the time? In fact, where our lesson begins today, it had been a long day for Jesus. The sun had long slipped below the horizon and the coolness of the night was beginning to settle in. The stars were shining in the sky like diamond studs against a black velvet background. There they were up on the top of the Mount of Olives. The windswept slopes as they stand there listening to Jesus preach another message. Jesus was a masterful storyteller. He could have people spellbound as they sat and listened for hours. And on this particular occasion, Jesus was in rare form. He was preaching such a powerful message that we still talk about to this day. He preached a message about what was still to come. Like he was looking down through the corridors of time, he was exposing what will happen in days beyond their day. He told them about wars and rumors of wars. He told them about nation rising up against nation. He told them there would be false Christs and false prophets. And, and in our passage today, he told them about the fact that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness. And then the end would come. And just to make sure that they were ready for the end, Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 tells three stories. How many? He tells three stories in Matthew, the 25th chapter. The first of those stories he tells is of a wedding party. And there were five foolish, uh, foolish virgins and five wise virgins waiting for the time for the wedding to begin. In the last of those parables, he tells a story of how a shepherd separates his sheep from his goat. But today, I want us to focus on the middle one. That middle story right there in the center. We're in Matthew, the 25th chapter. If you have your Bibles, Matthew, the 25th chapter, and we're beginning in verse 14. Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning in verse 14. That's where we will have our lesson today. Matthew, the 25th chapter, and beginning in verse 14. When you have it, please say amen. amen. If you need more time, say hold on, preacher. If you don't have a Bible, say Lord, have mercy. Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning in verse 14. Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning in verse 14. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, but whatever version you have does just fine. Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning in verse 14. Are you ready? Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. It is written, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Listen, Jesus begins this story. He tells this parable. He spins this yarn about a very wealthy employer who was planning a very long trip. Before the man leaves for his trip, he calls his employees to him and he gives them their instructions. And this is what the Bible says in verse 15. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Now, if you have the King James Version, it says he gave him a talent, but a talent is not an actual measure of money. It is a bag of gold. Are we together? In fact, a talent is, it actually has a very specific weight to it. It is 33 kilograms. How much? 
33 kilograms. The, a, a single talent is equivalent to 33 kilograms. So the, the, the master gives to each one of his servants at least one bag, one talent of gold. Now, I, I, I was curious about what the Bible is talking about, the, the, the numbers that Jesus was talking about. I was curious. Somebody asked me, what were you curious about, Pastor? Thank you. I appreciate you asking. This is what, this is what I found, that, 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 that a, a, right now a single kilogram of gold, today, I checked this morning, a single kilogram of gold is worth $46,000. One kilogram, $46,000. Right now in the market. So these, each bag is 33 kilograms. Are you with me? We're doing some math today in church. Is that all right? We're doing some math. Let me help somebody out. So a single talent of gold, one bag of gold, based upon current market value, is worth $1.5 million. Mm. Let me help somebody out. You, you know, oftentimes we feel bad for the one who only got one bag, but that one bag is $1.5 million. The one who had two bags got just over $3 million from his master. And the one with five bags received $7.6 million from the master. This master was balling. I mean, to have that kind of money just to be passing out to your employees and telling them to invest it for you. He gives even the one who had the least had a million dollars. Now, what would you do with a million and a half dollars? The master gives him a million and a half dollars. And the Bible declares that, 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 that this master then leaves them with the money and goes on this journey. Now, if that were your money, would you be giving that to your employees for them to invest? You have to have quite a bit of trust in your employees to leave that kind of money in their hands. And the word of God says that this is exactly what happens. In fact, Jesus tells his story. He's using it as a symbol for Jesus is declaring that he is the master going on a long journey. And in his absence, he has left with you and I certain abilities, certain talents, certain gifts in our possession that he wants us to invest on his behalf. Are you with me so far? Am I in the word? Am I in the word? He, he has not left us empty handed just as a master left sacks of gold for his servants. God has given each and every one of us certain abilities, certain, certain things that he wants us to do. In fact, everything about you is a gift. The, the, the family you were born into is not an accident. God chose that family just even though that family might be dysfunctional. Even though you might not be able to stand somebody in your family. That family was chosen by God for you. Are oh, you still not with me? I, I mean, let me come talk to my amen corner over here. That your personality is a gift from God. Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Whether you're shy or outgoing, whether you are the one who is at the life of the party or you're the wallflower, God chose you and gave you that personality for a reason. Oh, oh, oh. I need, I need some help in this place. Come, come on, talk to me, somebody up there. God designed you, whether you're an outgoing or shy, tough-minded or fair-hearted, uh, people-focused or task-oriented, God designed you to be who you are, like the hippopotamus. You're supposed to be who he designed that you are to be. You are not an accident. Oh, let me be clear about that. No matter how you came into this world, whether your parents were surprised or not, you are not an accident. God has a place just for you in the grand master, in the grand scheme of how he designed the universe. He had a place that only you could feel. He gave you your talents and your looks and your abilities to fill that place. His plan is so big and so wide that it includes you for eternity. You're important to God. He, he, God has left us with talents. And just as one servant was given five and another two and another one, each of us have, a, have talents, but not each of us have the same amount of talents. The Bible says God gave, the master gave, according to their ability. He knows how much you can do with what you've got. God has given us individually what he wants us to have. So don't let anyone make you feel less than just because you are different than they are. Do you hear me today? God made you to be you. 
and to do only what you can do. Find out what God has designed for you and then do it. Not only that, he didn't just give us our personalities. We are rich in many talents. It was the gift of God that made you a superb singer. It's the gift of God that made you a dynamic designer. It was the gift of God that made you able to be, be an able communicator or provide you with a knack for helping people. It was the gift of God who made you a natural born leader or a whiz at fixing things. God gave these things to you. In fact, the talents that God placed within you reveal the plans God has for you. Oh, you missed it. We'll wind the tape and let me play it again for you. The, the talents God placed within you reveals the plans God has for you. Okay, let, let, me, let me break that down for you for just a moment. Several years ago, I used to work at Leone Meadows. And while I was there, I had the responsibility one summer of putting together, creating a barbed wire fence. Now, I'm a city boy. Raised in Sacramento, lived in apartment complexes all my life, never had my own lawn or piece of grass at all. But I was called upon as part of my job to build a fence. I, 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 can, I imagine what a fence was supposed to be. I knew what it was supposed to look like, but I had no idea how to do it. And so they passed out us a number of different tools, and, and I'm using the tools that I have at my disposal. And I took a shovel, and I'm trying to create a post hole with the shovel. I don't know if you've ever tried to create a post hole with the shovel, but there's a problem along the way. The, 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 the hole just kept getting wider and wider and wider, and it wasn't getting deep enough to put the, po the post hole in until somebody came along and picked up a post hole digger for me. I didn't know what that was. They said, this is the tool that you need because the tool does what it's supposed to do to get the job done. Catch me, somebody. If you're using the wrong tool, you won't get what you need to go. But the tool reveals its purpose. Mm, mm. The shape of the tool reveals its purpose. Come here, somebody. Your gifting reveals your purpose. You don't want to do what somebody else is doing because God has given you a purpose based on what he has given you to do. Your gifts, your talents reveal God's purpose for you. So if you're, if you're a shovel, don't try to create a post hole. You need to do what God has called you to do. There's nobody else who can do what you were called to do. Are you with me so far? Is this mic on? Somebody talk to me in this place. In other words, the design of the tool tells us its purpose. Just like a nail is made for a hammer and a key to fit its lock, our unique mix of talents help to reveal God's purpose for us. In fact, the Bible puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, for we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are his handiwork. That word handiwork in the Greek literally means we are God's masterpiece. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but sometimes you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and things just don't seem to be going well. For you know those days where, where you're running late, uh, you start the day off late and there's crust in your eyes and drool on your lip. You know what I'm talking about? You wake up and your hair's a mess and you stand there in the mirror and you don't feel too good about yourself. When you're standing there in the mirror, even with the crust in your eyes and the drool on your chin, you stand in front of that mirror and declare, I am God's masterpiece. I'm just glad God's not done working with me. But I am not a mistake. We, we must embrace the unique beauty that is within us. So this is what Jesus declares when he gives to each of the servants a bag of gold. Now, I don't know what you would have done with the, that bag of gold, millions of dollars, when the servant gave it to you. But I know what these gentlemen did. Back in the Bible, in verse 16, the Bible says this. Beginning in verse 16, it says, The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one who had two bags of gold gained two more. Verse 18, But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After the master leaves town, Jesus says the first two employees immediately went to work making money for their master. The Bible doesn't say how they made that money work. Maybe they invested some blue chip stocks. Maybe they invested in some real estate and, and flipped it for a profit. 
I don't know what it is, but whatever they did, they got 100% profit on the return. The, the, these, these servants knew exactly what they were doing. But catch this, this last one, this last rascal takes this bag of gold, a million and a half dollars, and digs a hole in the ground and hides that money and covers it up and goes on his merry way. Then the Bible says this in verse 19, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Can you imagine when the master comes home? He puts his luggage beside the door and he makes sure he gets in. There's no place like home. He, he takes a few moments to, to look over the place and maybe relax for just a moment. But then he calls in his servants. He wants to know what they did with the money he gave them. The servant to whom he had given five bags of gold steps forward and transfers ten bags to the master's ledger. And the master responds in verse 21, well done. Good and what? Faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The second servant steps forward and to whom he had given two bags of gold. And he steps forward and, and transfers four bags to the master's ledger. And the master replies in verse 23, well done. Good and what? Faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. But then trouble happens. The Bible says this in verse 24, call to account before the master. Verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Now, the Bible calls him a wicked servant. They call him what? Wicked. Call him a wicked servant. Not only do they call him wicked, they call him a lazy servant. Call him a what? Lazy. Call him wicked and lazy. But think about this for a, mo for a moment. Why is he called wicked in this passage? It's not like he stole the money. It wasn't like, uh, like he had gone to Vegas and lived the high life for a while. He could have stayed in the finest suites. He, he could have been popping bottles on his master's dime. He could have been doing all these things with the master's money. But he gives him back his money. It wasn't my money. I give it right back to you. Why is he a wicked servant? I was wrestling with this thing. I would have considered him wicked if he had done something crazy with it. But he just gives it back to you. Why is that wicked? Instead, he gives back to the money exactly what was given to him, not a penny more, not a penny less. And the servant said he knew the master to be a hard man. A what? A hard man. And he was afraid to lose his master's money. He wasn't going to risk the money and be in danger of losing it all. He didn't put it on the stock market so that when he came back, all of a sudden it was gone. He didn't try any great risk. He gave him back the money he was given. Penny for penny. Dime for dime. Here it is. I would think he was just being cautious playing it safe. He was being prudent. He knew he was a hard man. What would have happened if he had lost that money? What if he had tried and lost a million and a half dollars? He said, I know you. You're a hard man. So I'm just going to give you what you gave me. So out of fear of failure, out of fear of what? Out of fear of failure, the last servant dug a hole in the ground and hid the money. And I wonder today, are there things in your life that you would do if you weren't afraid to fail? Are there things you would try for the master if you weren't afraid you would make a mistake? Like the last servant, fear keeps us from doing all that we could do. We let our talents lie dormant like bags of gold buried in the ground because we are too afraid of failure. How many of us would sing a solo in church if we weren't afraid? Mm. Am I walking down your aisle yet? How many of us would, would raid our life savings to give to the cause of God if we weren't afraid? How many of us would go door to door knocking on doors in the streets of Oakland if we weren't afraid? What would we do for God if we weren't afraid of failure? Well, listen to the master's reply in verse 26 and 27. The Bible says this. The master responds to the servant, says, his master replied, you wicked 
lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Did you catch it? The master never refutes that he's a hard man. I would have imagined that he would have said, no, no, you misunderstand me. That's not who I am. No, he goes along with it. I'm a hard man. All right. I'll accept that idea. If I'm a hard man, you knew that I want return on this. At least think the least you could have done is put it in the bank. I would have got some interest, some dividends on it. You were afraid to lose the money. That's fine. You could at least place my money in savings account. You know, I was thinking about this and I got to wondering. If this last servant took his talent of gold and dug a hole in the ground and buried it, soon after the master left for his journey, what had he been doing all this time? <laughs> While the master was away, what was this servant up to? The other servants were out there hustling, trying to make money, but this brother buried it, put it in the ground, and then what? He's been sitting around the master's house uh, eating cereal all day. What's he been doing? There's something else going on in this passage. I need you to walk with me. I need you to walk with me. There's something that God is trying to teach each and every one of us in this passage. What has this lazy servant been doing? If you just buried it and did nothing else with the money, there's something else happening. Jesus is trying to get our attention about something in this passage. In other words, the servant's view of the master was just an excuse to do nothing. You were just being lazy. There were other options, safe options, but he chose not to do it. Something else is going on in this passage. I need you to walk with me for a second. Listen, just because he didn't misuse his master's money doesn't mean he had done what was right with his master's money. He had been given a responsibility. Given a what? A responsibility to make more money. And right here, Jesus puts his finger on it. Right here, Jesus speaks to each and every one of us under the sound of my voice. Jesus is trying to say something to somebody in this place. Broadly speaking, there are two types of sin in the world. The theologians call them sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are sins that we actively commit. When you lie, when you steal, when you cheat. Those are sins of commission. They're sins of what? Commission. commission. And when we think of sin, that's what we often think of. We think of sins of commission. We think of how we acted a fool when that person cut us off in the street and you cussed up a blue streak in your car. You know what I'm talking about. Tell the truth and shame the devil. When we think of sin, we think of the fact that you called that friend on the phone and you talked about that elder behind his back. We talk about, we, we talk about, we're talking about sins of commission. When we think of sin, when we think of sin, we think of doing dirty deeds and we think of doing, making problems. But the Bible also makes it clear that not only are there sins of commission, there are sins of omission. Things we should have done that we did not do. Places we should have gone if we were of God and had the same spirit of God, but we chose not to go. Sins of omission, not just commission. Come here, somebody. In other words, the Bible is declaring to us that these sins of omission, a sin of omission is a failure to do the good that we ought to have done but didn't do. The servant ought to have traded on the master's money but chose not to. A sin of omission. He didn't do anything crazy with it, a sin of commission, but he was supposed to make some money. A sin of omission. That's why the Bible declares to us that it's not just enough to stop doing wrong. You missed that. It is not just good enough to stop doing what's wrong. The Bible says you must first also learn to do what's right. Some of us have this idea that if I just stop doing what's wrong, automatically I'm doing what's right. But that's not true. Doing wrong and doing right are polar opposites. It's not enough to stop going in this direction. You need to turn around and head the opposite direction. Oh, let me help somebody. So that the idea, the Bible says it this way in Isaiah 1 and verse 16 and 17. It says, wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. But catch this. He goes, continues, says, learn to do right. So he gives you examples of what, what it means to do right. He says, seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. 
plead the case of the widow. It's not enough to stop doing what's wrong. We need to start doing what's right. Let me walk down your aisle for just a moment. It's not enough to stop cussing and swearing. We must encourage one another. Yeah. It's not enough to stop backbiting. It's, we, need, we need to and build one another up in Christ Jesus. Uh, come in and help somebody. It's not enough just to shake our heads and say, isn't it a shame how they're treating the immigrants on the border? We have a responsibility to do something. God said, I didn't make this up. The Bible says, seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. We have a responsibility not just to stop doing what's wrong. We also have to start doing what's right. Think about it. Sins of omission. Times when we should have been compassionate when we weren't. We passed by that, that sister on the side of the road who was seeking some money, and we had money to give, but we chose not to. We didn't do anything wrong to him, but we passed him right by a sin of omission. Consider this. The, 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 the parable of the Good Samaritan, the two that walked on by didn't attack the brother. A sin of commission, but they passed on by a sin of omission. Jesus is declaring to us, it's not enough to not mistreat people. We must make sure that we lift them up and make them better for our presence. That's what Jesus would have done. That's what Jesus did. It's not enough to forsake the evil. We must learn to do what's good. And the more I think about it, the more I realize how unfaithful I am. Can I tell the truth? Say confession is good for the soul. And can I confess, I, I don't always do what I'm supposed to do. Uh, uh, I, I got to tell the truth. I, there, there, are times, there are times when I'm busy and I'm running. Uh, the other day I was getting ready for the evangelistic series. And as I was pulling around the corner up to the church, there was a brother whose car stopped. And I thought for just a fleeting moment. I was running late. I had to preach that night. And I thought for just a moment, maybe I ought to stop and help this brother with his car. But then I got to thinking, you know what? I, 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 I'm already late to preach the word of God. God should God have to forgive me for not helping this brother. Come on, somebody. And as I left, I had a case of the conscience. My guilt got to me, and I got started thinking about the prodigal, uh, I mean, the, the parable of the, of the good Samaritan and how the priest and the Levite were so busy doing God's will that they passed by the brother on the side of the road that needed God's help. Mm. Can we tell the truth today in church? Confession is good for the soul. There are times where I've been unfaithful, and the more I reflect about my life, the further and further I realize I'm not doing what God asked me to do. It's not enough to stop doing wrong. I also have to learn to do what's right. And if the truth be told, you and I are not like the first two servants. We're more like the last one. That if we were to take a good look at our lives, the truth of the matter is that we too could be declared to be a wicked and lazy servant. And I'm not the only one. For the Bible declares in Romans 3 and verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned from the pulpit to the door. I don't care if you're on the deacon board or the elders board. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even while we're trying to do good things for God, we're like the little boy who's trying to make pancakes for mama. We make a mess of things along the way. Can we tell the truth in church? We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all are messed up. We all fall short of God's glory. In fact, one of the things I find interesting about this passage is it declares that we fall short of God's glory. And the question that I have to ask is, what is the glory of God? What is his glory? When I was a child, I used to think the glory of God was the brilliance of his presence, the glory, the, the, the light that shone around him. But that's not what the Bible says. When Moses asked to see God's glory, glory God took Moses and hit him in the cleft of the rock. And this is what he declared. He said, I'm going to have my glory pass in front of you. And when he put him in the cleft of the rock and hit him there with his hand, the Bible declares that he came down and declared who he was. That his, his, his name was his glory. Catch this. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. It says, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord. The Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. The Bible declares... 
that when he showed his glory, he showed whom he was. And the question is, are we living up to that kind of glory? That's the standard. Are we as compassionate as God is compassionate? Are we as kind as God is kind? In fact, Jesus said, he compared us to God. He said in Matthew 5 and verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. That is the standard. So if that's the standard, how could we ever hear the commendation of the master, well done, good and faithful servant? We know sure well that we have not been faithful. How can we be lauded for faithfulness? How can we ever be invited to enter into the joy of our Lord? Like the little boy, we're sitting on the floor in the kitchen wanting to do right but covered in our mess. Is there any hope for us? Well, I got good news. I, I didn't stop by here with bad news. I stopped by here with some good news. You see, nearly 2,000 years ago under the hot Palestinian sun, Jesus walked the dusty roads of Galilee. He was a man attested to by God through miracles and signs and wonders. He didn't just keep himself from evil. The Bible says in Acts 10 and verse 38 that Jesus went around doing good. Doing good. When he was healing the sick, he was doing good. When he was raising the dead, he was doing good. When he was casting out demons, he was doing good. The Bible declares that he didn't just turn from evil. He also did good. And the Bible says that when we give our lives to Jesus, he takes the, the, we get the credit for what he has done. We get to wear his righteousness in place of our own. We get righteousness on credit. Mm, okay, okay. Anybody ever bought anything on credit? Have you ever gone into the store and you saw something you really wanted and, and you thought to yourself, I don't have the money right now, but I got this little, this little magic card in my wallet. And with this card, I just swipe this card and I can take whatever it is that I want right now, even though I don't have the money right now. Oh, you missed it. You see, I can drive off the lot in that brand new car, not because I have the money now, but because I have the credit right now. Okay, all right. You can walk off, walk off with those brand new shoes on credit. Mm -hmm. Not because you have the money now, but you can walk away with the shoes now. Okay, so let me put it this way. When you use credit, the, the, the financial institution that has all the money pays the price for something you want to purchase. Mm -hmm. and, and they pay for it, but you get to walk away with the benefits of that which they have paid for. Mm. So, so the, 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 the clothing is yours now, even though you don't have the money now. Mm. The, the car is yours now, even though you don't have the money now. Mm. Mm. The house is yours now, even though you don't have the money now. Come here, somebody. When you get it on credit, it becomes yours right now, even though you don't have the money now. The Bible declares that we get righteousness on credit. That because of Jesus Christ, the one who has all the financial ability, all the power in his hands, he's the one who pays the price right now. And we walk off with the benefits right now, even though we don't have the money right now. Oh, you're not with me. In other words, we get to be righteous right now. All the benefits that come with being righteous right now, even though we are messing up right now. The fact the Bible declares in 1 John in chapter 3, it declares there that right now we are the children of God. Right now. Right now. That if God had a wallet, he would pull it out and he would pull out those pictures. And there would be pictures of you and I in his wallet. And he, he'd be bragging to the angel, this is my son, this is my daughter. And the angels would be saying, the one that's messing up right now, the one that's acting a fool right now. And God would say, that's my child acting a fool. He's mine. She's mine. They belong to me. I give it to them on credit. Righteous on credit. The only way we'll be able to consider to be faithful is because Jesus Christ is faithful. His righteousness for ours. And that ought to change our lives. If we have the living, genuine article of faith, that faith should change us. We are saved by grace 
through faith. And even the faith doesn't belong to us. It is a gift of God. But catch this, that faith should also change us. We don't get in because of our performance, but our performance should change because we got in. I, I heard one evangelist put it this way. He said that, uh, that in, in the economy of God, God's the only employer that pays you up front and says, now work worthy of the pay. He gives you a million dollars up front and then says, now work like you're worth a million dollars. See, down here, with the, the, the pattern is you work first and then you get paid. You got to be good and then you'll get into glory. You got to do what's right and then you'll make it to heaven. But the, but the Bible says the moment you first believe, the moment you put your faith in Jesus, the moment you claim a call on the name of Jesus and declare, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. That moment you are saved. And he says, now work worthy of the salvation that's yours. We act differently not to be saved, but because we are saved. It should change how we act. In fact, it's so, the connection is so close that the Bible says that faith without works is dead. The way you know you have living faith is it ought to change how you work. Let me put it a different way. I have a little, I have a little speaker, that like it's a little uh, Bluetooth speaker. It's got great sound, and I use it for a number of different things in ministry. And uh, in fact, uh, my my church is envying me this speaker. They love this little speaker. I bring it to to prayer meeting, so we have a little bit of music at prayer meeting. And and I, I love that little speaker. But in order for that speaker to work, I got to plug it in every night so that I can charge the battery. Now, the way that I know that there's power flowing into the speaker is that there's a little indicator light on the speaker. And when that light comes on, it lets me know that there's power going to the speaker. Without the light, I wouldn't know that there's power. In fact, if I plug it up and there's no light on, I need to figure out where, the, where there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem in the power source. Because if there's power, there should be an indicator light. Come here, somebody. If there's power in your life, the indicator light should be good works. Good work should follow because you have power in your life. Now, the light isn't the power. But if you're connected to the power source, there should be some good works in your life. Are we together? You're made righteous by your faith. But your faith alone, by faith alone, you have righteousness. The only way we can be considered faithful by God is that we've got to be connected to the one who alone is faithful. And so I look forward to the day. When Jesus will say to you and to me, to the elders and to all those sitting here, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Come and share your master's happiness. It's almost as if it's God saying he's inviting us to the party that's in glory. A party the likes of which the universe has never seen. Now, I want to be at that party, don't you? What's it like when God throws a party? Does God use rainbows as streamers and planets as balloons? What's it like when God throws a party? Does God command Gabriel to DJ or does he have a live band on hand? What's it like when God throws a party? Does God use the moon as a disco ball, the stars as candlelight? What's it like when God throws a party? I say, when God throws a party, I wonder what it's like. Will they do the electric slide on streets of gold? Or will they do the Cupid shuffle beside the sea of glass? I wonder what it's like when, we, when God throws a party. Do they boogie on down in glory? Do they get on up? I wonder what it's like when God throws a party. I don't know what it's like, but I have to admit to you that I want to be there one day. And I can almost see the velvet ropes uh, as we walk up to the streets of gold. Uh, I look on over and I see who's at the party because you want to be at the right party. So you check out who's at the party. And I look on over, the, 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 go over those velvet ropes and I see who's at the party. I see Adam. Adam's at that party on streets of gold. 
Adam who messed up in the garden. How'd you get here? God of God declare, well done, good and faithful servant. It's because of the grace of Jesus. I see Adam at the party. I look on over the velvet robes and I see Noah. Noah's at that party. And I, I wonder, how did Noah make it in? I know he got drunk on the other side of the flood. How did Noah make it in? And Noah will be de de declare to me that's because of the grace of Jesus Christ. I look on over the velvet robes and I see Abraham. And, and I wonder, Abraham, how'd you make it over? And Abraham, I know you lied about your life. How'd you make it into glory? But he says it's by the grace of God. I look on over the velvet ropes and I see Moses. And Moses, how did you make it in? I know you were a murderer, but God stepped in and gave him grace. That's how Moses made it over. I look over the ropes and I see David. And David is standing there. How'd you get in, David? I know that you're an adulterer. I know that you're a murderer. How'd you make it in? It was by the grace of God. I declare to you today. That Adam is in there, and Noah is in there, and Abraham is in there, and Moses is in there, and David is in there, and they're only there because there's one uh, whom we are worshiping, uh, one who has paid it all, one who has done the best for us, and his name is Jesus. It's because of Jesus we too can hear, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. It's only because of Jesus. Do you believe that today? If you believe that today, would you uh, lift your voice with me as we sing hymn 248. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. There is a name. It sounds Come on sing oh how I love Let's sing that verse again. There is a name. is told of a fancy restaurant that opened in a particular city. The chef was world renowned and they had been spending months preparing the ground for the opening of this grand restaurant. It was incredible. Word had gotten out and people had come from near and wide to come eat and taste the food of the celebrity chef. On opening night the place was packed. Uh, so much so that the line was whooped out the door and around the block. And it means people were just standing in line for hours trying to get into this restaurant. Big celebrities and big names were there in line trying to get in. And when the place was full, people stood outside waiting for somebody to get up and leave their table. So that they could get 
place to eat. Well, for months this was going on, the place was just packed. And each and every time, each and every time the, the doors were open, the place was packed and the word was getting out. So the food was incredible. Incredible. The people were piling. And pretty soon, even people who couldn't afford to go wanted to be there. But one day, this young man decided he wanted to go, but he didn't have a reservation. They had to start getting reservations. There were so many people coming. He wanted to know if he could get in somehow, and he talked to a friend of his, and his friend said, oh, yeah, yeah, I got you. We can get in. Are you serious? For real, you can get us in? Oh, yeah, I got you. I got you. So they pulled up on the day there, and he saw the line. that this, The restaurant hadn't even opened yet, and there was already a line all the way around the block. They pulled up into the parking lot. They got out, and he said, oh, we're going to get in the back of the line. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come with me. We're going, we're going straight in. So, are you serious for real? We're going to get into this restaurant. I said, come on, come on, I got you. And they walked all past everybody who's waiting in line, everybody waiting in line looking at them. Wonder where are they going? They get to the very front, and there the bouncer was at the door. And the bouncer stood there and was telling the people there, you're not, if you don't have a reservation, you need to go ahead and get out of line because you're not going to get in tonight. And so the man, the young boy who wanted to get in there, he said, you know what, we don't have a reservation. How are we going to get in? I he said, I got you, I got you. And he walked up to the bouncer, and, and he said to the bouncer, uh, let us in. And the bouncer looked him up and down and said, what do you mean let you in? He said, well, we're, we're coming in to, to eat. Let us in. He said, do you have a reservation? No, we don't have a reservation. But you need to let us in. He said, what do you mean? Oh, no, you need to get in the back of the line. He said, no, 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 let us in. How are you going to get in? He said, hold on one second. He, he looked past the bouncer and he saw the owner, the celebrity chef. And he called him over and said, uh, the celebrity chef uh, let us in. And, 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 and the chef looked at him and said, oh, let them two in. Come on in. Come on in. And they walked in, and, and the other, the other one, brother said, uh, how do we get in here? How, how'd, how'd you get this hookup? He said, uh, you have to understand, said the, the chef, the chef is my daddy. I've always got the hookup because the chef who owns the place will let me in because I'm related to him. Come here, somebody. There is a reservation on Streets of Glory that people want to get in. People are trying to get in that place. But if you know the owner, if you know the one in charge, you can walk on in. I declare to you today, in the mighty name of Jesus, if you are hooked up with Jesus, if you're hooked up with the Son, you can get in to glory. Every head bow, every eye closed, every heart believing in this moment. The question for each soul is simply this. One day soon. Everything you've ever done will come up before the judgment seat of God. Every word we've ever spoken, every place we've ever been will come before God. And the only way we'll get into glory is he has to declare over each and every one of us, well done, good and faithful servant. If you are trusting in your abilities, you're trusting in your goodness, trusting in your performance, you will not make it in. But if you will extend your arm of faith and reach out and lay hold of Jesus, to put your hand in the hand of the man who can walk on water, put your hand in the hand of the man who can calm the sea, if you can reach out and put your hand in the hand of the man who died for you, you too will have access to that great party when he declares, well done. So in this moment, it's simply this, the question that you have to answer for yourself Will you put your trust in Jesus? I know some of you have been going to church for years. 40, 50, 60 years. But today the question that's put before you is, do you know Jesus? Just because you're in church don't mean you know Jesus. Do you know Jesus for yourself? Today is your moment. Hot breath of the Holy Ghost is moving up and down these aisles, sitting beside you, speaking to somebody today. And it is my responsibility in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to make an invitation on his behalf. If you want to declare to Jesus, I am standing with you, get me in. I will trust in nobody but you. All other ground is sinking sand. I put my trust in Jesus. If you're in this place today and say, Lord, take my life. I put it in your hands. I invite you to stand right where you are. You're throwing yourself on Jesus. I invite you to stand right where you are today. Stand right where you are. If you're putting your hand in the hand of Jesus, this is your moment. This is your moment. Stand right where you are. God sees you. God bless you. God bless you. 
God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. My next appeal is simply this. Perhaps you've been walking with the Lord, but recently you have found the fire is going out in your life. There was a time where you couldn't wait to open the Bible and study his word, but now it sits on your shelf and gathers dust. There was a time you were always at prayer meeting because you wanted to seek the face of God, but now you haven't prayed except over your meals in a long, long time. Perhaps you have been exiting, your, exiting yourself from the presence of God and the people of God and haven't been coming to church regularly anymore. And today you're declaring, I want to return to my first love. I want that fire again, that fire that won't let me keep, keep still. I have to tell somebody about Jesus. I want to be in love with Jesus again. If you're in this place today and you're declaring, Father, light that fire again in me, I invite you to stand right where you are. Light that fire in me. Stand right where you are. I want that fire. I want that flame again. Just stand right where you are. God bless you. God bless you. God sees you. God bless you. God bless you. This is your moment. Light that fire in me. Give me the joy of the Lord again. God sees you. God sees you. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Merciful Father, in the name of Jesus, you see those who are standing here today who are declaring they're throwing their lot in with Jesus. They're declaring if I make it in, it's only because Jesus gets me and I have no righteousness of my own. I've been a wicked and lazy servant. I pray, Father God, in this moment that you will cover everybody standing here with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father God, that when you see them, you see your son. I pray, Father God, in this moment that his compassion might take up the place where we have not been compassionate. His faithfulness will take up the place where we haven't been faithful. That his love might take the place where we've been unloving. I pray, Father God, that he make up a difference for us. And when all said and done, dear Father, I pray that he might save us because we've trusted him. And I pray, Father, for the individual who's standing today saying, Lord, light that fire again in me. Lord God, I pray right now that your spirit might fall afresh upon them and you will do something on the inside, that you will change things and rearrange things so that the fire might be lit again within them. And finally, Lord, for anybody on the sound of my voice who doesn't know the Lord Jesus for themselves, I pray in this moment that they will not let this moment pass them by. I pray, dear Lord God, that you will come rushing in and not give them peace until they find their peace in you. And when you come in the clouds of glory, and you gather your children from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. When you call us up from our graves where we have been laid to rest, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you'll be able to speak over every one of our lives. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. This is my prayer. For Christ's sake, loving you always. Amen and amen. You may be seated. of fear through every pain every tear there's a God who's been faithful to me when my strength was all gone when my heart had no song Still, my God, he was faithful to me. Every word he promised was true. And what I thought was impossible, I've seen my God do. Faithful, faithful. 
grateful to me Looking back His love and mercy I see Though there were times When I questioned Even failed to believe He's been faithful Faithful to me In my heart I looked away The many times I didn't pray Even then He was faithful to me The days I spent so selfishly seeking out what pleases me still my God he was faithful to me every time I'd run back to him he was waiting there with open arms and I'd see you once again. He's been faithful, faithful to me. Looking back, his love and mercy I see. Though there were times. When I question, even fail to believe, he's been faithful, faithful. There were times when I question, even fail to believe, he's been faithful, faithful. There were times when I question. Even failed to believe He's been faithful Faithful Great is thy faithfulness Oh God, my Father Faithful, faithful to me I always thought I was that five talent. I thought I got all that money. But today I realize I only got that 1.5 million. It's a very disappointing. Uh, but you know, I'm glad you brought the good news. Because without the good news, I would be living an illusion that I have that five. Mm, thank you. But we still have hope. And um, I just have to bring this home. If you have your bulletin, I just want you to look. Next week, on the, first, on the announcement, next week, join the elder, myself, and the urban ministry team. Let's go out after the Bible um, Bible workers, let's go to the homeless shelter. There are so many homeless shelters with children. We want to give them a backpack with school supplies. Next Sabbath, we're doing something different this year for school supplies. So 
as you admonish us to do, there are some people who are gifted financially and some aren't. But it's one thing we can do, even a pencil you can bring. So based on what God has blessed you with, come next week with a backpack with some school supplies ready for a child. If you have a pencil, come with that pencil. And if you forget, we're going to do it next week and the next week and the next week. School return August 19. So be blessed. Come with something next week. So now we're not only a bag of talk, but we are a bag of works. And it doesn't mean members. It means all of us, everyone under the sound of my voice. And in Market Street, there's no visitors. Once you come through the door once, you're not a visitor anymore. You come to the family, and we do what family do. So this time, we can invite you to stand. Prayerfully, we say, <clears throat> keep your eyes on things above, things spiritual and true. Love God, respect yourself, and peace will come to you. Walk tall through these cities with heaven on your mind. Step quickly into the teachings of Christ, for this word is no friend of ours. He has been faithful. Let's prove our faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.